For the past few years, the latest iPhones and iPads have had the processing power that their Mac counterparts could simply dream of. Well, that's no longer the case because the M1 MacBooks change everything. The M1 MacBook Air and Pro models are so powerful and yet so frugal in terms of battery life that they have started a revolution in computing circles. The M1 SoC is based on the A14 Bionic chip that powers the new iPhone 12 and the new iPad Air. This has created an interesting situation wherein a lot of people are wondering if the new lightweight and now everlasting MacBook Air can replace the iPad Pro and especially the 12.9 inch version. Let's find out in this video. My name is Ashish and I've had this iPad Pro 12.9 inch for the past couple of years. I have thoroughly enjoyed using it, but it did come up short on a few aspects, chief of which was the ability to use Google Chrome extensions. There is no way to natively run these on the iPad and the only solution if you want to use the iPad as your main computer and still be able to use these extensions is to dial in remotely to either one of your own computers or to a web service like AWS. What was most impressive about the iPad stands true today as well. The Retina display combined with the 120Hz refresh rate makes for an excellent experience. Websites feel so smooth to scroll on this display that you simply don't want to go back to a laptop or even a MacBook. And since all the apps run on full screen, the magnification levels are just right for you to be able to see and read easily. So first let's talk about the physical differences between the two. The iPad Pro has a 12.9 inch display and the MacBook Air has a 13.3 inch display. That means that the MacBook Air is taller than the iPad if you stack them vertically. You will need some sort of keyboard with the iPad Pro to make it into a laptop replacement and if you combine it with the excellent Magic Keyboard then the total weight of this combination will be more than the weight of the 1.29 kg MacBook Air. So at least in terms of weight, it is not as clear cut as you might think. So here you need to make a fundamental decision. If you like using a device as a tablet, then there is simply no competition. The iPad gives you that flexibility by being able to detach itself from the Magic Keyboard or for that matter, the Smart Keyboard Folio quite easily and turning itself into a slate computer, which is very handy in situations where you simply won't want to use a laptop such as when browsing on the bed just before going off to sleep or in an airplane seat, especially in economy where you just don't have the space to stretch out on the tray table with even a small laptop. In terms of a touch screen, if you're an artist or a student that requires this functionality, then the iPad is the device for you. The MacBook Air simply does not come with a touchscreen and most people find it more natural to interact with the touchscreen even when they are not used to computing devices from before. This is a definite advantage for the iPad Pro and the second generation Apple Pencil combined with the 120Hz refresh rate of the screen makes for an almost zero latency experience when writing on the screen especially in apps that have been optimized for this such as the excellent Notability app. The playing field is also level in terms of the trackpad and keyboard, now that you have the excellent Magic Keyboard with the iPad Pro. The Magic Keyboard is in fact so good that you don't lose out on anything when typing on this keyboard versus the Magic Keyboard of the MacBook Air. And though that trackpad might look small, it offers the same functionality as the MacBook Air and is just as responsive and good to use. In terms of connectivity, the MacBook Air, at least the model that's available with the M1 chip right now, offers two Thunderbolt ports as compared to just one USB Type-C port on the iPad Pro 12.9. The Magic Keyboard on the iPad Air gives you another USB Type-C port that is limited to just charging the device and cannot be used for communication. I like the fact that the Magic Keyboard base has been beefed up and the reason for that is twofold. One, is to give it some additional weight so that the iPad does not tip over when you put it at its extreme angle and secondly it doesn't feel flimsy when you lift it up from just the keyboard part. This was one of the chief concerns I had with the smart keyboard folio because the bottom part, the keyboard part, felt quite flimsy and really you shouldn't handle that device using that keyboard part alone. I've done a full review of the Magic Keyboard where I compare it to the Smart Keyboard Folio as well. I'll link it in the description below, so do check it out if you're interested. Another difference is the built-in LTE of the iPad. 
To some, this is an excellent convenience to have and having this option is certainly nice. But with seamless tethering that comes with the iPhone these days, I don't personally see much value in this, given the fact that I will never be without a phone when I head out. So then it comes down to the differences between iOS and macOS. This is again a fundamental decision. Both operating systems have their strengths and weaknesses, and the answer to which operating system is more suited for you lies in what you're planning or intending to do with it. iOS offers ease of use, convenience, and focus, whilst macOS offers tons of customization and the ability to break free from Apple's walled garden should you choose to do so. There are still things that macOS handles much better and others that the iPad can't handle at all. Let's take the Files app as an example. When this was introduced, the much needed file management function that was sorely lacking in previous iOS versions was finally available. However, compared to the full-fledged Mac Finder, this misses out on a few key features such as the lack of a progress indicator. This can be really frustrating, especially when you're transferring a large number of files and there's a lot of guesswork involved in knowing when the transfer is complete. Sometimes it will finish the transfer just when you thought it had failed. The speed of copying files, although the USB Type-C port on the iPad Pro is supposed to offer USB 3.1 Gen 2 speeds, is also slower than on the Mac. Now the M1 Macs are also not stalwarts in this area. We have seen in my previous videos, again links in the description, how the M1 MacBook Air can have slower USB transfer speeds than its Intel predecessors. However, it still has Thunderbolt 3 ports and when combined with a good dock, it can offer the full potential of USB transfer speeds. Check out my review of the Caldegit TS3 Thunderbolt dock, links in the description. Macs also offer the ability to run Windows via Parallels desktop and whilst in theory there are ways to do this on iPads, in practice they are impractical and slow. The iPad's Achilles heel is the lack of RAM and this makes Windows 10 unusable. This is just one example of tasks that you can do on a full-fledged computer and there are several such limitations in terms of software flexibility with iPadOS. Another limitation with the iPad is external display support. It can only mirror its display via a USB Type-C connection and that too in the 4x3 aspect ratio. That leaves ugly bars on the side of the screen unless you're playing a video, in which case it becomes full screen. Similarly, connecting a USB printer to the Type-C port or even via a dock will not do anything. Unless you have an AirPrint enabled printer, the iPad does not support printers at all and certainly no physical connections to a printer. On a positive note, the experience of using the iPad is still lovelier than the Mac. Everything still looks prettier, is formatted to fill the screen and combined with the 120Hz display refresh rate makes content consumption and even simple tasks like browsing the web a lot more pleasurable. This is an important point because it makes you want to pick up one device over the other. In fact, for me, this had such a profound effect that for years I have looked for ways to make the iPad a laptop replacement. And inevitably, it's always failed on that note and I keep coming back to the Mac. For professionals working with photo and video, again the software options are not as extensive or full-fledged as on a Mac. But the ones that do exist are really compelling. For example, Luma Fusion is an excellent video editor that can export your projects equally quickly or sometimes even faster than even the M1 MacBook Air running Final Cut Pro and that is with the A12X Bionic chip and not even the A12Z or perhaps an upcoming tablet variant of the new A14. Similarly, there is something natural about editing photos with the Apple Pencil. It offers precision without needing to master mouse movements and combined with the touch screen, zooming in and making fine adjustments is really easy and fun to do. A note here on devices expected in the future for both product lines iPad Pros are expected to get a mini LED display in the coming year that will make them a lot more vibrant and power efficient. MacBook Air and Pro lines will see design refreshes that will shave off the bezels and perhaps get mini LED displays too, besides next iterations of the M1 chip that will combine with a dedicated graphics card in the bigger models, offering much more grunt for GPU intensive tasks. Time for some recommendations. 
The iPad is a really powerful tablet that has mastered the art of being a tablet and is learning the ropes of being a traditional PC really fast. That means it's headed in the direction of being an effective all-in-one solution somewhere in the future. However, if you're looking for your only computing device today, think hard about what you want to achieve with your device. For content consumption, portability, and for general office tasks and note-taking, the iPad is hard to beat. It also does well for reading, drawing, or any activities that require the use of a touchscreen. Battery life is generally good enough for a typical workday without the need for a charger. But if the idea is serious content creation, the iPad can work. But it will take a lot of workarounds that can be frustrating at times. It's just easier to have a full-fledged computer in such situations and this is exactly where the new M1 chip-powered MacBook Air comes in. It offers perhaps all the good bits of the iPad with the exception of a touchscreen and marries it with the unrestricted nature of macOS. Combine that with even better battery life and now a fanless silent design and it becomes clear why it's making laptops something that you want to pick up rather than a device you only use when you need to. In that vein, the formula has nearly been perfected and will only get better over time with better displays and designs and even faster chipsets. For now, to make things easy, one is the best tablet on the market that can double up as a PC for a surprising number of tasks and the other is the best ultra portable laptop in the world that just got supercharged with a revolutionary chipset. Look at them this way and choose based on the device type you need. Hope you found this video useful and please consider subscribing if you did. Thanks for watching and I will see you in my next one.